Hi, everybody. This is Jay Halfon, the Higher Education Administration Program at Boston University's Wheelock College. And I'm pleased to welcome you and welcome Dr. Chicka today, who's um, a university chaplain at Boston University. And um, Jessica, if I, if I may, uh, has, has a very unique job and uh, during very unique times. But we tend in higher education administration to overlook the importance that spiritual life plays in student community. And Boston University is a non-sectarian, pluralistic, um, um, private university of Methodist origins, United Methodist origins. So not only can religions be practiced, but we actually facilitate and fund those different religions. And those religions have expanded quite a bit, and the international population has helped to to lead that um, that that movement, and, and Jessica has probably one of the most unique jobs in in, in higher edu in, in in the religious aspect of higher education. So, welcome, Jessica. Um, mm -hmm. If I may, um, what was your what was your background? How did you get to this point with this sort of combination of religious leadership as well as working in a university setting? Um, well, I guess one thing that you should know about me is that I am a perpetual student, so I, uh, <laughs> I, um, it's a good place to be there. Yeah, I finished my undergraduate degree in 2005 and came to Boston for, for graduate school and, um, had a little bit of a time period where I wasn't here, but I have basically been here since then. So, and doing grad school since then, I just finished my PhD last year. So, um, so part of that is I've just been in higher education for a really long time. Um, my areas of interest are, are in theology, obviously, and in, in studying, uh, for me, Christian traditions, uh, particularly, but I've also studied all religious traditions um, in my time, uh, including focusing on uh, traditions from South Asia and Islam and things like that. Um, so uh, academically, I'm interested in ecological ethics, which is looking at sort of how uh, faith can motivate us toward making environmental um, decisions in our lives, how our morals and values are shaped by our religious traditions or the lack thereof. Um, but uh, chaplaincy work actually, it, and as some of for some people, this happens uh, is something I just sort of happened into. Um, <laughs> so I actually started at, at uh, Marsh Chapel as a part-time campus minister for Lutheran students. So that's my my particular religious tradition is um, Protestant uh, Christianity, Lutheranism in particular. So um, I, as a doctoral student, it was a 10 hour a week job and it was, you know, working with students and teaching them about my religious tradition or sharing religious tradition with them um, and doing, you know, worship services and community service opportunities, stuff like that. Um, and uh, in my time is when they created the position that I'm now in, which is University Chaplain for International Students. Um, and it is a unique role. Um, as far as we know, there is no other school that has a university chaplain that is specifically assigned to working with international students. Yeah. Um, there are many campuses that have chaplains who are multi-faith chaplains, so they work with people from all different religious traditions um, and, and things like that, but not specifically looking at, at international students. But it, it was a priority for the university just because, um, as you mentioned, we have you know, almost a quarter of our student population is international. And so wanting to make sure that we were meeting the needs of those students, um, because even though things like uh, Christianity and Islam um, and Judaism are practiced around the world, depending where you are, context matters. And so those traditions can look very different um, depending on where you come from. So, um, my involvement, I, I've actually worked with international students in my time as a PhD student, uh, working with them on uh, writing and uh, being a TA and all of those things. Um, and when my predecessor in the position left, um, it seemed like a good opportunity for me to continue doing some of that work. I had been working with, with her 
with some of the chaplaincy before that. And so um, I just really enjoyed getting to know people's experiences, how their cultures shaped um, their understanding of the world and their faith and their spirituality. And um, it's a really rewarding position to just um, really, you know, to, to get to learn from others and, um, and have it be a sort of a two way street rather than a, you know, a one way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm sure it is a learning experience because instead of practicing and working with, with a Lutheran population mm -hmm. congregation, probably very few of the 25% international students are Lutherans. So. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's a, even probably maybe a negative number. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so you've, you've gone from serving one one denomination within the within the Protestant Church to mm -hmm. to every other denomination, excluding the one in which you. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, so it's it's really your curiosity, at least, and, and maybe your perpetual students. Yeah. So how have you been able to learn sort of everything else there is in the world besides Lutheranism? Um, well, you know, as I said, some of my studies have taken me into to studying some of those other religious traditions. Um, I've always been interested in comparative um, theology and comparative religious study. So uh, I've done a lot of work in Hinduism and, and Islam. Um, but I, I think in particular, I've learned just by being open to students who come from different backgrounds and, and being willing to listen and hear, you know, what their experiences are. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we have all sorts of different, so the way that um, BU is set up is uh, the Center for Religious Life on Campus is Marsh Chapel, um, which is a Protestant um, center on campus. So it is, it's predominantly Christian. Um, but then we also have our Hillel House, which is for our uh, Jewish students, and then we have a Catholic center, which um, is a Newman house, is part of the diocese of the Catholic Church in in Boston, and so they have a a Catholic priest who serves them. Um, and then every other uh, religious group on campus is student run. So mm -hmm. we have an Islamic society at Boston University, um, which is student led. They do have a, a campus minister, is what we call them, a volunteer um, who's actually currently is a Harvard Divinity uh, student <laughs> uh, who works with them. Um, our Hindu Students Council is completely student-led. Uh, you know, we, we have a Jain uh, group on our campus. So we, we represent the full gamut. Um, and then our, our office oversees all of these groups. So we okay. make sure that they are following religious life policies, which include, you know, not limiting who can be a part of that group. So any student, whether or not they are a practicing member of that community can, can come and be a part of those groups. They follow the same tenets as the other student activity organizations on campus. So every, every group is open to every student. Um, and we foster conversations. We, um, we look for ways to help those groups navigate the, the bureaucratic systems of the university in ways that are helpful for them. And, um, you know, we also are there to mitigate situations if they need assistance with something. Um, um, and then we also help enforce the religious life policy uh, for the university, including, you know, religious um, observances for students if they need to, take time away from class for religious observance or things like that. We help um, work with faculty members and yeah. the students to understand what that, what that yeah, means. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And, um, w w are, are there unique concerns or issues or um, I don't know, uh, do international students focus in, in a different way or unique way um, on religion within the community that's different than the 75% from the United States. <laughs> I mean, well, and I think, I, I guess one qualifying statement I have to say is that international student means everything that isn't U.S., right? So that's a lot of different people. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to caution from right. giving blanket statements on international students. Sure. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, depending on people's country of origin, what their, what their um, 
spiritual upbringing is yeah. for some people their their spirituality is very important very central to their life and they want to maintain the values that they uphold from their religious tradition and for some people maybe their country has a national religious tradition but they've never really interacted with it and it's just something that's a part of the culture but they don't really you know know anything about it so um, it really does vary from person to person um, culture to culture um, you know I think one thing that we try to do is be open um, be a place where there can be open questioning and open um, dialogue about religious traditions and understanding, um, especially for, for some of our international students who have never experienced religion before. Um, there is a lot of question about, you know, what does this mean? Why do you believe this? Do all Christians believe this? Or, you know, different, different things. And so it, we, we try to be a resource also in sort of doing some educational aspects of, well, you know, Christianity uh, is a very big, diverse <laughs> group of people, um, just like Islam is a very big, degree, right. d diverse group of people. Yeah. And, and so there are different practices that happen in different things and different, we even have different beliefs that, you know, we all hold depending on what kind, what flavor we are, right? So, right. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, um, encouraging students that they don't have to be afraid to like ask questions if they have questions about things or making them feel like they should know, which is never, you know, that's never helpful. No. Um, but, you know, with some, with some folks, it is harder for them to, to inquire about those things. So making it a comfortable experience too is just, you know, I try to set the bar pretty low in terms of what I call like entry into our community and space right. so like yeah. there is no requirement you don't need to know anything about anything to come and right. talk to us or participate in events that we have um a, a lot of things that i do are more like spirituality focused rather than mm -hmm. religion yeah. um so in a typical year when we aren't having a pandemic <laughs> i do things like spiritual paint night which is is yeah really focusing on the process of creating something rather than being concerned about like whether you're doing it right or not. And, um, you know, we do global dinner club once a week where we cook like a different international food oh. every week. And, you know, food is a great way to bring people together. Um, yeah. unfortunately it doesn't look like we'll be able to do that. Yeah. Well, we'll be eating our own food right. via zoom, which is what we ended up doing for the rest of last semester. But yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, well, just, you know, not having a lot of, um, you need to know these things before you can be a part of whatever it is we're doing. Yeah. And, and I'm sure some of it involves sort of the social needs of international students as mm -hmm. any group of students. And I've often thought that international students have an incredible amount of courage mm -hmm. and, and perhaps self-confidence maybe to, to, to relocate to another part of the world, maybe not even being fluent in the language, maybe yep. not knowing all the traditions and customs, maybe not necessarily even being sort of well-oriented once they get here on what to do. Mm -hmm. we, we express a lot of concern and sympathy with first-generation students. In some ways, international students are first-generation you know, squared in a sense. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a bigger factor of lack of familiarity and religion mm -hmm. may, be, may be something that's familiar to them. Um, absolutely. And, and therefore, therefore comforting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think we don't really recognize the traditions and the things that we, we hold dear to ourselves when, um, until we're separated until from we're them. separated, exactly. Um, yeah, we had a whole series where we talked about like home and the idea of home and how do you like conceptualize that and as an international student like how do you make a new place feel like home even if you can't physically be at home so yeah, yeah. no absolutely or, or, or explain your pre your 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 other home to people here with, exactly with overcoming stereotypes let's mm -hmm. say and clarifying the fact that not everybody is like what you see in in the movies or see absolutely movies. absolutely yeah. yeah yeah or you know even like I feel like, you know, for some of our students from China, you know, um, I don't, I, at least 
you know, my knowledge of China is not super great. And like, I think uh, people from the United States assume that everybody knows like where all of the states are in the United States. And like, you know, that right. California is on the West Coast and Massachusetts is on the East Coast. And you asked me to point out where Beijing is. I have no idea where it is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on a map of China. Yeah, you know? Americans have a terrible double standard. And, you know, <laughs> everybody speaks our language. Everybody knows everything about American history, geography, et cetera. Yet we have mm -hmm. almost complete ignorance. Of mm -hmm. Well, that's an important thing about about sort of spirituality and religion too is is being able to share those stories right because sh sharing a story with someone is a sacred act right sharing especially personal stories about like where you're from and like your experiences in life it's a very like sacred thing to to sh have that sort of intimacy with someone else of sharing like what your experiences have been and so Sometimes for some of our international students, that's a little bit harder to do because that's not necessarily a part of their culture is to, to share sort of information like that. Um, but we, we try to build the sense of community, the, the relationships and bonds between students in a way that that becomes more of a comfortable thing to open up and be able to talk about, you know, what your experience has been or even things that might be bothering you or things like that, which, you know, an, is another part of my job is providing pastoral care. And um, I'm not a, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, but I can um, speak to them about where their heart is right now. And um, if there are any resources that I can connect them with, if they need if they need more assistance rather than just a conversation or something like that so even being comforted with i'm sure i'm sure mm -hmm. loneliness and detachment are yep. probably significant in, in themselves they probably miss their home country they probably miss their family they probably miss mm -hmm. their friends and they probably are tired of trying to speak english all the time and yep. you know, all those things probably kick in and just i think this being someone who listens is probably an important Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But that is like one of the biggest barriers, I think, too, for us is that um, for some folks, they don't have any familiarity with what what a chaplain is, what why you would go see one, why you would you, why would you go and talk to somebody? I think there are plenty of people in the United States who also may not know what a chaplain is or why you would go talk to one um, or automatically assume that I'm Catholic or something like that. So like, um, getting students to understand that like oh well no you can just come talk to me you know we can go get a coffee and I can listen if you have if you want to talk about something or it can be a big thing it can be like you know big ex existential questions of like why am I here and right. what is my purpose in life right or it can be little things like my roommate's really annoying and I don't know how to deal with it and, and you know um can you just listen to me and maybe give me some advice or something, you know? And you're, and you're probably a lot in some ways safer than a psychotherapist might be if, if that's not common in their culture to, yep. to talk to a professional. So, mm -hmm. so, so being able to sort of you know, kind of define yourself a little less um, formally than, yeah. than, than, a, than a professional psychotherapist may actually be more inviting in some ways too. Yeah. And, and I'm sure I'm sure you know you you're trained to hand off people that need to be yes handed off absolutely for, yep. for, for, for deeper um, types of issues yeah yeah absolutely yeah, we are we are referral people we know the good thing about us is that we're connected with everybody else on campus so we know who to who to send you to if you need some more help then we can provide and we're not gonna try and solve those problems uh, yeah. for you yeah. Do, do students who come from, in particular, Middle Eastern countries feel discriminated against? Do they feel that, that there are prejudices that, or, pre, well, prejudice in the literal sense of, of sort of their prejudged, their preconceived notions of what, what Arabs are like? Um, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and does that make people self-conscious? I think so. You know, I think there is that low level uh, prejudice that exists in our society. I think that, you know, obviously we're having a lot of conversations about racism and, and other factors that um, are sort of undergird a lot of American society right now. Um, I think, you know, for some of our students, again, uh, 
we're not so good with the world history or world geography or anything like that in the United States. Um, and so um, we also aren't good with religious education in the United States. And so we don't know a lot about um, religious traditions that are different from our own because it's not something that is a priority for us to be taught. And so, um, you know, people don't understand Islam um, or they don't understand that everyone who comes from a middle, a country in the Middle East is, doesn't necessarily have to be Muslim, right. um, that there are plenty of Christians and people who are Jewish um, who live in those areas. And, and, and um, there's separate groups of, of Muslims. Who, and, and, yes, uh, that there is a diversity within Islam. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so not every not every Muslim person believes the same thing as every other Muslim person. And there are people who, you know, uh, th there are people who dress in certain ways and that is part of their understanding of Islam. And there are people who don't adapt uh, to those, those same ways of, of dressing or acting. Um, and that's just, you know, it's the diversity within the religious tradition. And so, um, I think, yeah, I, I, having had conversations with some of our students on campus, there is some uh, preconceived notions about what people believe, what they do, um, how they act, uh, just you know, based on these um, stereotypes that we've been fed, that have been fed to us through media and other things. Um, and getting getting students getting faculty to understand that there are these not these monoliths of this is what this thing is yeah. but that there is a there is a lot of variety within um, traditions and that even within that understanding the actual tenets of religious traditions rather than things that you've been told by somebody who isn't an expert in those things yes. yeah, <laughs> um, well, yeah. And and just like Americans may not know all those things that you say, you know, geography, history, et cetera, chances are that their their vision of other countries is going to be based on either what they've seen on television or in the movie mm -hmm. or, or at Epcot or whatever. Yeah. They're, not, they're, not, they're not likely to be going to those countries, especially yeah. during the pandemic. But um, so, <laughs> so in some ways, the, the culture has come to them at a place yep. like Boston University. So the question yep. is, you know, can we really take advantage of that in the sense of creating this kind of dialogue across yep across groups they, absolutely and a big challenge. So. it is it is you know um some some groups of people are more interested in having conversations <laughs> than other groups of people so yeah. um yeah. you know we we for a while we had a very active interfaith organization on our campus and it was student run and and was excellent and you know as with most things on a college campus you go through cycles of right students and interests and engagement and so you know we um, are sort of in a low period right now but I think it's ramping back up again of having interest and having sort of more of those interfaith conversations and uh, learning about different religious traditions there's always students that are interested in learning about different religious traditions it's just getting them connected in the ways that they need to be connected and on a campus that's as large as ours sometimes that can be difficult because if they don't know where to go initially they just kind of give up so yeah i know <laughs> and i've also thought that the larger the campus the smaller your circle is more likely to be in yep. terms of people you deal with and and and, <laughs> and, and it, it would just be a crime for students to go through a college experience and never meet people outside their own uh tribe in a sense and yeah um, whether it's a religious tribe or an ethnic tribe or whatever, mm -hmm. we, we, tend, we tend to think of separate communities, but we shouldn't separate those communities. Um, and, 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 and your word interfaith could be intercultural, it could be any number yeah. of different ways of looking at it. But, yeah. you know, but, uh, but, th but that, that, that's a challenge, I'm sure, to get, you know, I don't know, um, those who have an Islamic background to talk to those who have a Jewish background, mm -hmm. and et cetera, and, and, and just have people understand the the humanness behind each different group yep yeah yeah and also just our students in general tend to be 
super engaged and super busy all the time. And so right. getting them to slow down enough to have those conversations sometimes is a challenge yes, too. Yeah. So I, I've spoken with the, with the, with the, um, with the Jewish chaplain who says their biggest events in the year is when they serve Chinese food yep. uh, and, it's, and it's free and, yep. and, and, and they have hundreds of people come. So, so yes, it's probably, it, it, the motives are not always necessarily religious. They can be, you know, oh, I, yeah. I, I, I like Chinese food. <laughs> free food is a big drawing point for things. And so we'll see how this next year goes when we can't do any of those <laughs> offerings. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> That's an excellent segue. So, so what's happening in terms of, you know, in, in terms of what can you, what can't you do and what can you do because of this um, social distancing that is going on? Yeah, so uh, obviously in March we had to pr pretty quickly shift to online, just like everything else. Um, so uh, March Chapel, we, we have a worship service at, um, every Sunday morning, and it's broadcasted on WBUR, the radio station. Um, and we pretty quickly had to just... Um, for a little while, we were doing only having people who were participating in the service on Sunday mornings, live broadcasting. And then we had to completely shut that down. And we've been pre-recording uh, pre recording some stuff and then taking um, bits and pieces from services from previous years and pasting them all together to what we call Franken services of, of old stuff and new stuff. Um, so we've been doing, yeah, we're, it, that's what we're, we've been doing with the um, new guidelines and regulations that are being put in place with the building. We um, will hopefully eventually be able to go back to doing some of that live broadcasting on Sunday mornings, maybe not with a congregation there. Um, but that is one of the hardest things is that worship spaces are probably one of the highest contact points for yeah. um, transmission of COVID. So um, it's been interesting to see how people, how different religious groups have been adapting to this. Um, so, you know, for Christians, we had Easter happen um, during this whole period. And so it was a very different experience where we were celebrating Easter in our home, own homes and we weren't with other people. Um, some churches have started to do some like outdoor services because they can, they can safely do that. Um, and uh, for, I know after Ramadan finished, um, or actually, actually during Ramadan, I know that there were some groups of, um, of Muslims that were meeting on in online spaces like Animal Crossing and were breaking fast together in Animal Crossing <laughs> um, as a way of just like being in community with others because that's what you're supposed to do. And so we're finding new ways of adapting. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of Zoom stuff. So toward the end of the semester, you know, my, my global dinner club, we were meeting at our regular time um, and just, you know, each of us bringing our own dinner and just having conversation. Um, you know, checking in with students, uh, it's we're in a position where we're often having whoever walks in the door is sort of like the the people that we're we're greeting and so you know um sometimes it's it's unpredictable but you know when you're having to set up zoom meetings with complete strangers that's an even yeah. more in your you know in their bedroom talking to them. <laughs> it's a little right. yeah um so you know had some of those um because obviously it was a very high anxiety producing time for everybody and trying to figure out you know what what was the best course of action a lot of students were trying to decide whether they should go home to their home country or stay in the area um because they didn't know if they would be allowed to come back into the country once they left um and Still yeah exactly and and some of them ended finally at, at the end of the semester because I, I you know there wasn't a lot of some students ended up staying on campus because they could but um a lot of the housing sort of went away over the summer and so right. um some of them had to go home and and so you know this learn from anywhere is going to be interesting um, <laughs> yeah. um yeah. but uh yeah. i think when we um for the fall i'm i'm personally planning uh, the space in marsh chapel other than our sanctuary which is where we do our worship services we have some smaller function rooms in the bottom 
part of the chapel. Um, but if we have to maintain social distancing, it means that we can only have like three or four people in a room at a time. And so um, I think what we're planning to do is be mostly virtual for the fall semester with any of our programming, just because we can't gather people together. So we're trying to think creatively of how can we do things like Bible study, book study. Um, I do a lot of like creative arts and crafts sort of things. So are there things that we could, you know, make up little take and go arts and craft projects that people could stop by and pick up and take home and work on. Um, and so, you know, just trying to think about how, ca how can we continue to do some of the same stuff that would be face to face uh, in a virtual environment because we just, we just don't have the, yeah. the means to be able to, to do it in a, a safely in a space and we don't want to endanger anybody like that's no, no. that's the biggest priority and so you know we we would love to have worship again but we don't want anyone to get sick so no. um just encouraging student groups i think are to be sort of yeah to be creative and and you know they're so adaptable they know how to use all of this technology way better than i do and so you know they've they pretty quickly hopped on to how to have you know, Zoom meetings in different ways and, or using different platforms other than Zoom because it's not always the best. So, <laughs> um, but, 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 did, but did you find that the virtual attendance numbers were comparable to what you would have before, higher, lower? In other words, are, 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 are there some sort of blessings behind this crisis in the sense yeah. that maybe communication might be easier? Online? Honestly, I think that, um, I think that we saw we saw a lot more interest generated in yeah. spiritual outlets during this time because yeah. it was there was so much uncertainty, yeah. um, and pe people were just looking for ways to connect, um, and we had ways to do that, and so we were able to offer spaces for students to come and and there was nothing required of them. They didn't have to do anything. We mostly just checked in with people to see how they right. were doing. Um, and it was great because <laughs> the students left for spring break and they didn't come back. So they didn't get to see their friends and they, you know, and like, obviously they can FaceTime each other or whatever, but sure. to have the, the specific groups of people that we would normally have to gather together be able to come together right. on a Tuesday night and each be in our own space and right. just say oh hey how's it going you know like I haven't heard from you in two weeks and I just wanted to see how you were doing or you know um it was I think our we stayed pretty stable up until maybe like the last two weeks of the semester and that's usually we start to see a little bit of a downtick because everybody gets stressed out but um, but we were having, you know, pretty good attendance and people would just stop by for like five minutes and be like, I just wanted to say hi and see everybody and I have to go to another class or whatever. But it did allow students that had class during that time, like, or if it was close to that time to be able to like hop on for a few minutes and then be like, oh, I have to go, I have to go to class. But like, normally they wouldn't be able to come because they'd have to go somewhere on the other side of campus or something like that. So, yeah. um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think being able to offer those resources and we're we're building up our skills with using things like social media and right. other digital pl platforms over the yeah. summer so that when the school year starts we're actively engaging with students in those through those uh, through those media um, in a way that yeah. you know they know we're available to them even if we can't be physically in the same space yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, if and when we ever get beyond the pandemic, and and and, and, yeah. and whether and, and, and how how the virtual coexists with the physical in a sense, yeah. because we may not always need physical houses of worship the same way yeah. in the future that we needed them in the past. Maybe we'll learn how to work more virtually as well. Yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll be it'll be interesting, and it is it's you know, as all of these churches just like outside of where we are but like at, all of these churches and everything have moved had to move to online platforms and stuff like that yeah. it's been a really interesting experience for the church and having to think about different theological ideas like communion and how do you do you yeah. do that do you not do that like there's just there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff there so <laughs> Well, so, 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 so what's your forecast for the fall? Will, will there be international students on campus? Oh, I think it'll be a lot lower than previous years. I think, um, 
well, number one, wh whether they'll be able to travel back into the country will be a question. Um, and in some cases, it might be better for them to stay in their home country, given how our numbers have been, but who knows? <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it may not be the best, the safest, healthiest yeah, place to be. To go, yeah. yeah so, uh, um, yeah, I nope. think... I think we may see a little bit of a, I, I mean, I know that there are some students even who live like on the West Coast or stuff like that who are planning to, to stay at home just because yeah. they, they can and they want to create more space for people who do need to be able to come back right. to campus. That's so, right yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be an, an interesting, uh, I hope it's a transition, but it'll be an interesting transition for the fall, maybe the spring. Yeah. But then, but, but then of course, it's, it's kind of, almost fun to be futuristic and think think about what might happen once this settles in the future uh, what will what will we have learned what will we have changed and how we behave with these right other? right um, anyway so so it, so it sounds like you've had not only an, you've had an interesting job but you've had it's become even more interesting as you've had to learn how to adapt yeah um, to these changes yeah Jessica, thanks very much it was a pleasure seeing you and of course um, and uh you know it's I, I'm, I'm sure students will find this fascinating because it, it tends to be an aspect of student life they tend to um, not necessarily focus on.